So now that we've figured out how to go out and collect our data, uh, we're going to start thinking about the things that we can actually do with it. So throughout the rest of this chapter, we're going to be focused on ways to organize, summarize, and present data. And we're going to do that in terms of these five main characteristics. So in this lecture and the two following it, we're going to focus on what are called frequency distributions. This is a tool that's going to let us see both how our data is distributed and whether or not it has values that are unusual in the sense that they lie far away from the rest of the values. That's what we mean by an outlier. All right, so in this table, I have a relatively small data set. It's a collection of 24 student grades, the grades for a medium-sized class. Now, I've been working with numbers for most of my adult life, and I can't really tell much just by looking at these. Even just 24 numbers, in no particular order, is too much for me to really be able to make observations or statements about the class. So to make sense of this, uh, we're going to need ways to summarize it. So what I've done here is I've taken the data and grouped it into ranges. Right? That's what you see over here in the left-hand column. Right? Then in the right-hand column, I went back to the data and counted. Right, how many data values fit into each of the different groups. This kind of summary table is what we mean by a frequency distribution, or uh, it's sometimes called the grouped frequency distribution. So this is something that I can actually get information from. Looking at this, I can see that the data is clustered near the upper range. That's the 71 to 100 range. I can also see that the 81 to 90 range has the highest number of grades. Um, there were relatively few A's, and I do have what looks like one outlier. That's this one grade all the way down here in the 21 to 30 category. That's the student who's going to be getting the phone call. All right, so hopefully you see now the value of this kind of summary, right? Thinking of the data in groups rather than individually made it a lot easier to see um, what the trend and groupings were. So what I've done here is I, I just took the grade groupings and laid them out horizontally instead of vertically. Right? There, are, there are a lot of standard terms associated with these groupings, these classes, and I think it's easier to discuss them if we have them laid out horizontally rather than up and down. So the first two definitions here, lower limits and upper limits, kind of go together. So lower and upper. Okay, the lower class limits are just the smallest values in each class. So for our data, that would be 1, 11, 21, 31, and so on up to the last class, that's 91. Then the corresponding upper limits, those would just be the greatest value. So that's 10, 20, 30, and so on. Again, going all the way up to the top class where the upper class limit is 100. So the, the third definition here, the class width, this is something that students struggle with sometimes. The width of the class is equal to the difference between two successive lower limits or two successive upper limits. So for example, if I pick 1 and 11, their difference is 10, and that is going to be the class width. Right Now, uh, you could do the same thing with two consecutive upper bounds, and you should still get the same result. For example, uh, 20 minus 10 is also 10. 
right? The class width should be the same for every class size. Shouldn't matter um, which which two classes we pick, the results should which two consecutive classes we pick, the results should always be the same. And you can see this is the case here. I, if I just randomly picked uh, 41 and 51, for example, that difference, just like the others, is also 10. Right? There are there are occasional exceptions to this rule, right? And we'll see some of that. Um, we'll see one example of that a little later in the lecture. So we've got two more definitions, right? Uh, first, the class midpoints are just the middle of each class, right? And you can find these. Let me label it here. Mid points, right? You can find these by simply averaging the upper and lower bounds. For example, the midpoint of the first class is the average of 10 and 1. That's 5.5. Right, the second class is the average of 11 and 20. That's 15.5. Then 21 and 30. That's 25.5. And hopefully you're starting to see a pattern. Right, notice that these class midpoints are all 10 units apart. And if you remember from the last slide, 10 is the class width. Now that consistency it isn't a coincidence. From here, I don't have to actually do all of the calculations. I can get the remaining midpoints by just adding the class width over and over again. 55 and a half, uh, 65, 75. If I just get them all in here and 95 there we go all right now to see the class boundaries notice that there are gaps between each class for example the first class ends with 10 but the second class doesn't start until 11 all right it's those gaps that are going to determine the class boundaries all right so the class boundaries are just the midpoint of each gap. So the class boundaries of this second class would be 10 plus 11 divided by 2. That's 10.5. And the next one, the add the kind of the upper class bound of this second class would be 20 plus 21 divided by 2. That's 20.5. Okay, the next class boundary would be, let's see, 30 and 31 divided by 2, which is 30.5. And now, hopefully you see, we've got that same pattern happening again. Everything differs by 10, that class width. So I can get the remaining ones by just adding 10 over and over again. And I'm going to use the same strategy here. Um, when I get to the end, I'm going to have a little trouble here getting the upper class boundary of the last class, right? Because there's no next class to average it with. But I'm just going to continue my pattern. I'm just going to add the class width again and get 100.5. And to get the class boundary, the lower class boundary of the first class, I'll just subtract 10, right? And go backwards. 2.5. So you see these classes are all here in the middle of the gap between two classes. Okay, so uh, this um, takes care of all of our definitions. All right, all of our definitions. So I do want to look at one more thing here. All right, notice um, the class sizes in the second table, right? There are exceptions to our rule that the class size should always be consistent, right? If you take a look at the right-hand distribution, it summarizes the same data set as the one on the left, except you can see that I've shifted the groupings. So I'm starting at um, zero here instead of one, like the original one did. Um, and the class with are all still 10 except for the last one, right? The last one here, 
has a width of 11. You can see that if you subtract these values. 100 minus 89 is 11. So I did this because we're talking about grades. Right? And grades have a natural grouping into groups of 10. 60 to 69 is a D. 70 to 79 is a C. And so on. So even though it broke my rule to have the last class go from 90 up to 100, it's still a reasonable choice because it groups the data in a natural way that corresponds to the way that numeric grades match up with letter grades. Right? So you can break the rule here. Right? You can break the rule if uh, you've got, first, you've got a really good reason. And second, when you're presenting your results, when you're presenting the table, uh, it's a good idea to, to point out that you did this, right, and to explain why. All right, so in the next lecture, uh, we're going to look at two more different types of frequency distributions. One that displays uh, the relative data and the other that displays what's called the cumulative data.